Okay, welcome all summon. We have a very special episode today. A guest who, unlike me, has some very extensive formal education on the subjects uh, Norse and Scandinavian mythology. Um, Scott Shell, and he also has a great YouTube channel that I'll link down below in the description. Uh, how are you, Scott? How's it going well there today? Great. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, the elves and the hidden people. Um, so first, I thought I should go ahead and sort of introduce myself and yeah. let your audience know exactly who I am and yeah, what kind of background and education this, this things like that. People would love. To yeah, hear. exactly. They always ask about that sort of thing. So um, yeah, no. So I am Dr. Scott Shell. I have a PhD in Germanic linguistics. Um, I got that PhD from UC Berkeley, and uh, when I was there, I you know I focused a lot on linguistics, like Old High German, Old Saxon, Old English, of, of course, Old Norse and Runology. Um, but I also taught numerous classes at Berkeley on Germanic folklore. And so that's why, you know, of course, we're going to do this episode today. Um, but yeah, not only did I teach courses on folklore, but I also gave various papers like over in Estonia on the hidden children. And um, it's just kind of been, you know, one of my favorite subjects to talk about, especially when I teach in class. And oh, the freshmen, the sophomores, they just ate it up. They just, they just uh, loved it. Did, did most of the people there kind of take those classes for just filling up the, their schedule or were people really interested in it? I think initially it was because they had to fill up their schedule. Yeah. So uh, because, then you won them over. I did really. Um, in fact, there were several, several reviews rather from some of the students um, where they had, you know, they were usually STEM majors and they would take my class um, you know, because it was like a required English class or required composition class, mm. and they were dreading it. But when they arrived there and they saw the reading list and the reading material, and we started talking about crazy things like elves dancing people to death. Um, they just, they loved it. And so, yeah, uh, like I was saying, several of the evaluations actually said that they loved coming to my class because all the other classes, you know, were focused on the sciences and, you know, a lot of they had to deal with like a lot of number crunching and everything and so when they came to my class it was sort of like a nice relief for them to do something different very cool very yeah. cool lucky lucky students and lucky we are today to have you on it's uh yeah it's uh, certain people are just a lot more knowledgeable in certain subjects and we're lucky to have scott on to to hear about the elves yeah thanks um so i mean yeah just a, i just a couple more things i guess i do have a book coming out yeah. uh this month actually uh, called the application of Persian semiotics, dealing with runology, um, and of course, uh, some of my viewers already know this, but I um, contributed to a book called uh, "The Rune Poems: A Reawakened Tradition," and in which case, you know, so my point here is that I'm still very active, you know, in the community, and um, you know, just trying to do everything I can for both academics and, and heathens alike. Yep, sounds good. Sounds good. And yeah, you, your channel is really great. And I just saw your last video this week on the hidden people. That's uh, yeah, I'll, mm. I'll send people there and you guys should all check out Scott's channel. It's especially for the continental Germanic. I know there's lots of people you can go to to learn about the Norse sources, but the continental Germanic, they have the same religion as us. It's just different things and different sources. But so definitely everyone should check out his channel. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and the term continental Germanic can actually be a little confusing sometimes for some people because they're like, well, isn't Scandinavia part of the continent? Which is a legit question, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's actually sort of rooted in linguistics. Basically what it means is anything dealing with old high German sources, Gothic sources, and old Saxon sources. So, yeah, 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 exactly. So the elves, right. what do you so, think is a yeah, good place elves. to start on there? All right, so the one question I always like to ask everyone when I start talking about this subject is what is an elf. So I will get um, an, an answer for a different answer from, you know, a, a different given person. So let me ask you, <laughs> what is an elf? What would you say an elf is? Oh, it's without even bit... drawing on your sources either, like what would you say? Like yeah, this, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Man, yeah. I, I know a good amount of the sources. So for for someone who had not read the sources and even me and because I'm familiar with it and the folk tradition and even mm -hmm. you know little uh little uh holidays we have around Scandinavia elves are just these little men uh, some people might also refer to them as Santa's helpers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they could be little little men running around causing mischief mm -hmm. um but when you start to dive more into it it's uh, not just folklore it's really 
a deep part of the spirituality and very symbolic and very one of the most important spiritual entities that there are uh, that people would have regular day-to-day -day contact with. That's when you start to uh, read into it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Def they, they definitely have lost their, their sort of true importance, right, as to what they once were and what they once represented. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there for people who haven't formally studied elves and folklore and the myths, because sometimes we'll think of like Legolas, from the Tolkien series. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Tolkien may have been right in his rep representation of the elves, but only from a particular source. Uh, but then also Dobby from Harry Potter yeah, yeah. is also called an elf. And they, to say the least, don't look alike. Um, <laughs> so they're very different, uh, you know, creatures. Um, J.K. Rowling actually was correct in the sense that it was sort of like a household servant. And she was actually rooted in folklore. Um, but the thing is, is that Dobby should have actually been referred to more of like, more of like to a Nyssa mm. or a Pompe, because you actually give him this piece of clothing and then he is set free. And so that has actually nothing whatsoever to do with elves. Mm. So that's one common problem that you find in folklore, especially Germanic and Scandinavian folklore, is that we want to call them certain things, like we want to call them fairies. We want to call them nymphs. We want to call them you know, dryads or forest people or whatever. That actually just really distorts the worldview and it makes it really tough to understand because then we start saying all of these things are the same. They're just like X, Y, and Z. And they're not. Like, for example, um, the mermaid is actually like the whole half fish, half human um, spirit. That's actually from Greek. That's not Germanic at all. Mm. So, you know, that's brought in from a later source. But, um, you know, my whole point here in, in bringing this up, though, is that the concept of what an elf is is extremely ambiguous, and uh, it, can, it can mean all sorts of different things. And so today we're going to go ahead and zero in on what these things actually are, um, you know, instead of just uh, conflating, conflating them with all these other different terms. Yeah, sounds good. So I thought we'd maybe talk about some of the mythic material and move into the folklore material and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly, because that's, that's the first thing I, would, I think people would be interested in is, you know, the pre-Christian sources in the Eddas, um, Alfheim, um, yeah. light elves, dark elves from the Norse beliefs. Um, and of course, they're not mentioned as much in the pagan, you know, the origin sources as people think. So I'd like to just go over those quickly, what you have to say yeah. on that, and then use that. And what do you think kind of the most important parts are as that continued on to the folklore and tradition then. Right. So the way that elves are depicted in, let's just use the prose out of, for example, in Snorri, because he gives a very good description of them. Yep. Um, I don't think we particularly have an exact origin story of the elves in the Eddas. I don't, nothing is really coming to mind. I mean, of course, the dwarves with maggots and Ymir, but I don't think particularly with the dwarves. Um, but Snorri nonetheless actually associates, associates them, of course, with Alfheim, who is, you know, uh, rather the god that rules over Alfheim is, of course, Freyr. And he describes these light elves as being fair in appearance and very beautiful to look at, uh, almost, quote unquote, intentionally angelic. Um, however, he contrasts this to the dark elves, which he says actually live down below in the earth. And he calls these... Um, like the swarthy elves or spark spark you know they, so they live in Elfid Elfid or dick elves is the other one and so it's also very important for the viewers to understand that the distinction between the light elves and the dark elves is purely snorri's invention mm. and it may have actually been rooted in the christian idea of angels and demons mm. and in fact it sort of comes up it sort of makes me think about it that way because if you read foley's fall uh, at the end, it actually says that the, the light elves dwell at the, at the end of Ragnarok, that the light elves dwell in a place even higher than Gimli in a sort of very high heaven that only light elves can, can reside. And so um, that being said, again, Snorri has that sort of distinction about the light elves and the dark elves. And the dark elves are, of course, uh, dark and swarthy, and um, they're nothing like the light elves. The other thing that I wanted to mention too, though, is with the elves, is that if you look at where they appear 
especially in the poetic era sources, mm -hmm. the elves only appear when the gods are mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, a famous uh, phrase from Polispell, Kvat Ermed Olsen, Kvat Ermed Olvum. And, or it might even be the other way around with Olsen and Olvum. But the whole point is that the A there alliterates with the other A. And so what scholars have said over the years is that it was just used as like a literary device because they needed something to alliterate there. Mm. I don't necessarily agree with that entirely um, because they could have used any other word that began with a well. But uh, the point here is that they really don't have a whole lot of agency in the poetic era, for example. Mm. They're just kind of there with the gods, as we see in Locus and too. They're just kind of hanging out. Mm. What is your uh, opinion yeah. on the elves related to the dwarves? Because I know some scholars have theorized that. I don't know if I believe that entirely, but the elves and the doors are kind of interchangeable in some ways. What, what do you think about that? In an Eric times? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, when, when you look at the, um, the dwarves, which Snorrigan calls dark elves, but if you look at the dwarves, their mm. functions are completely different. Yeah, right? yeah. First off, the dwarves have functions in the Eric. Yeah. Right? So they're responsible for uh, creating Skiff Vladimir. They're responsible for, you know, creating all these different treasures. Uh, for the gods, Odin's spear, you know, for example, um, you have all these small where, you know, there is a dwarf trying to pursue Freya. Um, no, I think they have a lot more agency. And of course, they even, speaking of Freya, they of course uh, forged the Brazilian. So you have these dwarfs which have way more agency and they almost seem like their own distinct category. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't think that they're interchangeable at all. Maybe yeah, later in folklore uh, traditions because things do begin to sort of get a little more complicated there, but yeah. Okay, okay, sounds yeah. good. Oh, but the one strange exception in the Poetic Edda is Volander. Volander yep. actually in the Poetic Edda is referred to as an elf. Um, but again, Volander is sort of on the cusp where he's sort of in the mythic material, but he's sort of in the heroic material too, right? So you see him appear alongside Sigurd, for example, in Fidric's saga. Um, and this is actually where I think one of the functions of the elf um, is true, actually. So if you look at Volander, and he's referred to as an elf, and you look at the word elf in Proto-Germanic, which is either albies or albas, depending on how you want to reconstruct that word, it means like the shining one or the noble one, or it could be like a sort of noble ancestor. And I believe that you actually made a connection to that in one of your recent videos, right? So yeah, the, the, the thing that's the main thing, of course, if, if we look a little bit deeper in the symbolism and, and some of the other mentions of elves later on, they kind of seem like ancestral spirits or related yeah. to the ancestors. But one very clear mention is uh, the tale of Olav Geistadolf, which is a lesser known little part of a saga. And that's where uh, the uh, legendary uh, Olav, a king, is buried in the mounds, and then he basically instructs the people to bury him in a specific way and specifically do not worship me as an elf. But then they eventually worshipped him as an elf anyway, and then he was reincarnated as uh, uh, Olav the Saint uh, 150, 200 years later. So that's mm -hmm. one very clear example um, of pagan belief in elves being somehow connected to the ancestors, dead ancestors. Right. And I kind of think that Volander would be in that, that same light or a similar light to where he would be venerated as a sort of honorable ancestor, a sort of honorable heroic figure of some sort. And, um, you know, you and I have sort of talked about this a bit, but, you know, for example, Alva Blut yeah. versus Disa Blut, right? Disa Blut, there's no question that it's a bloat of the Deesir and it's or to the Deesir of the Deesir, if you will, but that sort of um, bloat is meant specifically for noble women. And we even see that Freya is the Vana Dees, right? She is the noble woman of the Deesir. Contrastively, if you do look at Alpha Blue, we see that it is a bloat to the elves or of the elves. And we know for a fact that elves were only masculine before Britain and the oncoming of, of Latin and really screwing a lot of things up. Hmm. Uh, they were only masculine. Yeah. And so, and, and then Freyr, of, of course, is, is affiliated with Alpine and, and the elves as, as well. And so what I'm trying to say here is that you have basically Bisa bloat, which is the bloat for the noble women. 
And then you probably have alpha bloat, which is the bloat for just noble men and noble ancestors, which also makes sense too, for why they would be up there with the gods and dining with the gods, mm. right? Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, that before, but uh, yeah, it makes sense. If you want to go ahead and move into the folklore area now. So yeah. it's, a, it's a bit different, actually, it's entirely different. Um, but we do sort of see, uh, you know, we do sort of see the, um, the elves as ancestors, or they could be ancestors, um, but they can do both good and both evil in the highest degree. And so that's actually from a specific folktale in, in Iceland, for instance. But before I jump into really the functions of the elves, I wanted to go ahead and just talk about the origin of the elves real quick. Yeah. And the reason why is because, like I said before, we don't have a really, really like an origin story with Snorri, but we do have an origin story here, albeit it's not really entirely heathen, but it's kind of interesting how they're portrayed. So basically, um, there is a war between God and Satan. So already in a Christian context, very clearly. Yeah. Um, but what happened is that when Satan fell to earth, the Nyssa and the elves and the dwarves said, you know what? Um, I'm not going to be a part of this battle. I'm not going to side with God. And I'm not going to side with Satan. And so they actually just, they fell to earth. And so when they fell to earth, they became associated with the moors, they became associated with the hills and with the mountains. Um, and so that's basically how you have the origin story. So there is a particular Norwegian tale though that says that these, these, uh, these elves are specifically not Christian like quote unquote us in the tale, it actually says that. So that sort of makes you think about it too, where it's like, if they aren't Christian and you know they're not Christian and you're still interacting with them and you're still leaving them offerings, are they these very dead old ancient ancestors? Because they couldn't be Christian, right? So they were, they were heathen. And so, you know, there's, there's that sort of dynamic that plays into this as well. You see that dynamic kind of go back and forth uh, throughout the tales because even though there are some sources and some, 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 some tales rather that say that they aren't Christian, there actually are tales where they say that they are hoping for salvation, for example. So it's clear that these people, the reason why they probably created these stories to where these, these elves were hoping for salvation is probably because that way the, the person who was Christian could still try to find a way to interact with these ancestors and with these land lights, right? Mm. And leave off or do you like think that. at that time when they went after Scandinavia became Christian, but the elves were not Christian, as you mentioned, do you think that's kind of uh, suggestions of the afterlife belief? Like, oh, these might have been ancestors who did not go on to the Christian heaven, but those people at the time wanted to. So that's why do you think there's any connection there? Um, yeah, possibly. I mean, like, you're, you're right, right? They couldn't have, they couldn't have gone to heaven. The dead, the dead ancestors. I mean, they weren't baptized or anything like that. They were actually, you know, part of the pre-heathen or pre-Christian tradition. Um, you know, but um, I don't know what else to really to follow up with with that. But yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. funny thought. I don't know. Uh, it's, yeah, but, but we'll we'll see a bit more. Maybe that question gets answered a little bit later on. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So getting back more into the the function of elves. So the function of elves is very different from the, the religious material, like the Edic material. They actually do have agency, but they are not going back to the, the sort of prototypical idea of an elf. They are not little men making presents for Santa by any stretch of the, imag the imagination. Um, and they are really responsible for causing disease and causing mischief and um, there, there's just nothing really that great about them. So it also makes you wonder too, if that Alva Bloat was actually sort of there to appease the ancestors so people wouldn't piss them off and get mm -hmm. sick, for example. We spoke about that. Right, you know, so, um, but the word, speaking of nightmares, the word Albtraum in German, you say, commonly you say, ich hatte einen Albtraum, which means I had a nightmare. It's very commonly used still in German, the word Albtraum. But if you look at that word, it's the first word is actually elf, 
And then the second word is actually dream. So actually what you had was an elf dream. So it's, it's showing you at least etymologically that there once was a belief that it was the elves who caused nightmares, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, as I had mentioned before, there's also the dancing with the elves. This one is very strange. Um, essentially, I'm gonna go ahead and read you a tale here, Archie. It's only a few lines. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is a boy named Yen uh, was herding in the woods once when he came to a place called the Dead Elves. He did not return home with the cows by noontime. They went out looking for him, and when they found him, he was quite out of his mind. The elf folk had danced with him, and from that time he grew no more. He never became any taller than a small boy. So do not dance with the elves. <laughs> That's essentially what that's about. Um, well, there, there's that form of dancing with the elves, and then there's actually another form of dancing with the elves, which is linked to death. So in this case, it's obviously linked to uh, insanity, right? But around New Year's Eve, uh, if you would dance with the elves or later on, which became the devil, no surprise there, um, they would dance you to death. Mm -hmm. And so you, you literally could not stop dancing. And it was contagious. So if I started dancing, you saw me dancing, you had to start dancing. And this all sounds really funny today, right? It's like this contagious sort of like disease or something where people can't stop dancing, but they actually danced until they died. Mm -hmm. And this is not just some fairy tale. This actually happened. It was called uh, the dancing plague of like, I think it was 1518. Wow. And so, yeah. And so there was uh, this, this dancing plague that spread throughout Europe. So you find these dancing motifs of like dancing with elves and, and dancing with the devil uh, all throughout Scandinavia, all throughout Germany, um, even into, I believe, the other uh, areas, like the romance areas too, where we have this, this sort of uh, idea of dancing with elves until you die. So, and so uh, the next example is usually uh, tied to elves and taking people into the mountain. Mm -hmm. So this is a very common motif. What would usually happen is that somebody, you know, in a rural village would hear a voice calling him into the moor or into the forest and, and then, of course, often into the mountains. And what would happen is that this person would follow the voice and this would be the voice of an elf, usually an elven woman at this point. So you can already tell how late this is because, as I had just said before, elves were only uh, male ancestors. Yeah. Uh, but either way, uh, what would happen is that usually it was like a young boy would get lured into the mountain or lured into the forest. And when they would come back, they were declared insane. They couldn't string sentences together. They were out of their wits. They didn't know where they were. And quite often they were also rendered as uh, mentally ill, mm -hmm. which actually leads me to um, another story. So this is, or another, I should say another subset rather, the elves are actually tied to changelings. So many people have heard of the changelings, but usually the changeling is sort of its own category, but the elves are actually sort of associated with change, changelings as well. And where we see this, for example, is when um, an elven woman would come in at night and there would be a baby there, but usually this baby had some sort of like birth defect. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, or how the story goes is actually it's sort of like the baby's actually perfect. <laughs> and what happens is that the elven woman comes in with her own baby, which has a quote unquote birth defect. And what would happen is that the elven woman would swap out the supposed perfect child with her own. And then the the parents would actually wake up and see that there are there are issues with the child. There are like physical deformities, for example, and then they would blame it on the elves. So that's kind of an interesting idea of seeing how these people dealt with medical illnesses, um, basically by saying, well, this wasn't my child because he was, you know, my child would have been born with, with both eyes, but this one's obviously missing an eye. So the elves must have come in overnight and exchanged our perfect child with one of their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a big uh, part of the folk tradition too that I can remember if they would call a birthmarks and like birth spots, they would call them like elf wounds or elf burns. Um, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a kind of ties into the same type of thing. Yeah, it does. Um, so they were called like elf, uh, 
let's see, I have a list here actually. So let's see, uh, we got Danish, Elvis Kud, uh, no, which is actually Elf Shop. Yeah, yeah. And I can't pronounce Danish, so I'm sorry if it sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Norwegian Elf uh, And in German, we have Elfschutz, which is not used anymore in modern German, but you know, it's, uh, it's Elf Shop, in which case was literally the elf shooting someone to inflict a disease. Mm -hmm. And they also had Elf this, which is like an Elf stab. Yeah, yeah. Um, we still see that in German, in modern German, with the word Hexenschuss, which means lower back pain. Hmm. Uh, so it's literally like a witch shot that they yeah. still use to this day. Yeah, so. yeah. A troll shot too is um, something I'll also always used. I wonder if it's kind of a troll shot is almost always considered like a curse that's done from a witch or something in the folk tradition. But yeah, it, yeah. Is elf shot pretty much the same? It's pretty much the same. Um, it, it really is. But one thing that I can tell you is that you will never find troll shot in any other language outside of Scandinavia. Mm. So okay. the troll shot is very specific to Scandinavian sources mm -hmm. and the word troll is specific to Scandinavia. Uh, we actually borrowed that word troll from the Scandinavians. There are absolutely no tales about actual trolls in the geographic area uh, below Scandinavia. Okay. There are other, yeah, there are other words that they use, but they don't use trolls. Um, there are all kinds of like weird kobolds and stuff like that, but yeah, that's a. Scandinavian are the elves on on in like Scandinavia or Germany or even England uh, and in that folklore has they later turned on to fairies sometimes? But is do the elves always have kind of the same function in the different countries, or can that be different too? They generally all cause disease. Um, that's a commonality. The nightmare is a bit different. Um, that was actually associated with like night and mare, which is like a night creature that causes you yeah. nightmares, right? Uh, but in German, I think German is the only one th that we actually have like uh, Alptraum where it's like literally an elf dream. Mm -hmm. um, but to talk about these functions real quick, like you were talking about uh, just a minute ago, the functions get extremely distorted in probably like later old English into really like middle English times, especially around like medieval theology, hmm. because what happens is that these, these people want to create like Latin uh, glosses for a lot of these words like elves. And what happens is that they use words like orcus, which is an orc. So that, that word orc actually is not a Germanic word whatsoever, or they'll use the word nymph and assign a nymph to some sort of like water elf. Now, you can already see the problem there because you're blending two different worldviews. You're blending two different semantic spheres, if you will. And you'll see um, the dryad, for example, was actually used as like a female elf, I believe. And so that's actually where you start getting the female elves is because of the later British tradition that came in and started to give us these Latinate words, which were female and like map them onto these words for elves. So you can see right there, that's when everything starts getting all, all messy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. The more time that goes by, the further the information gets lost pretty much mm -hmm. and distorted. So I have one more example for you uh, yeah. regarding elves and the folklore tradition. This one is particularly strange. It has to be rooted in heathen practice. It has to be. Because what happens is that the elves will come around New Year's Eve, in which case was the exact same time as Christmas Eve, according to the people telling the story. So they at least believed that they were the same day. And they believed that New Year's Eve was Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is that a lot of these people would need to go to church, but they needed somebody to stand guard to make sure, like, I don't think that reasons ever really stated, but probably so that the elves wouldn't move from one location to another. That's another common motif. It's called elves moving house. Um, but when, what happens is that this one person volunteers to guard the crossroads yeah. to make sure that the elves cannot, like I said, cross over. And when this person does this, the way that he is um, allowed, or the way that he sort of controls them from not crossing to the other side is that he withstands them, he, he resists them. Because what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to tempt him with um, wonderful 
ale and, and mead and wonderful foods and just things that you can't resist and these beautiful treasures. And if you do not uh, acknowledge them, so you cannot talk to them and you pretty much have to just uh, be silent and not acknowledge them whatsoever. If you do that, then they will eventually leave and you will be left with all these, you know, delicious foods and all of these wonderful treasures that you are allowed to keep. Of course, most of the stories don't end up that way. Mm. So what happens is, for example, the person will try to resist, 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 and then they're like, oh, but I really like those bacon drippings. <laughs> so so um, they give into it. And when they give into it, then all of the treasures disappear, all of the food disappears, and then you're rendered as just insane. Mm. So it's like being taken into the mountain again. So you go back to the village, you're out of your wits, uh, you're not making a whole lot of sense, and you know, which actually ties into possibly journeying. That's why I wanted to bring this up because of the whole um, crossroads thing. You're at a crossroads, you're at a threshold, and specifically in these stories, um, specifically in a story by Jacqueline Simpson that I just recently reread again, it said there that that person who went insane was doing uti seta. He was literally sitting out. And it's very rare that you can actually see an example where somebody is sitting out for that kind of purpose. And so if you put it into the context of sitting out in uti seta and what he was actually doing with communicating with elves and everything, it seems like there was some sort of like journeying or something that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then they said too, following up with that to, to sort of compound it, uh, the, the, the storyteller also informs us that even though he went insane, even though he was crazy after the fact, he was still prophetic. He still had second sight, but this is because of many of the many other times he performed Uti Seta. Mm -hmm. So he was still able to retain that prophetic, you know, aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so, so let's see, he had successfully completed it multiple times, but that for the people watching, if, if they're going to try it, if they want to try those things, it's so it's very important then to stay focused and not be tempted to whatever elves might come around and uh, offer you things. It's just point yeah. is just to stay on focus and you get the benefits without the insanity. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay, okay. There people have it. Okay, so to kind of build on to what we were just speaking about the elves whatever they may be it's uh, pretty clear that they were venerated in some way and that people would prefer not to be on their bad side so if people were to you know do any practices or worship or rituals are there any uh, uh, attestations and sources that speak about how people might do that to make benefit from the elves in order to ward off disease or gain power or good luck or profit things like that just to not be on their bad side basically yeah i mean so as far as uh not be on their bad side like i said before with the alpha bullet thing that actually makes a ton of sense right they want to start sort of steer clear of those diseases and so they might actually appease the ancestors by giving them these offerings um we are familiar with things called like elven mills i don't know if are you, are you, are you familiar with those no no so basically so there's like a cup in a stone, right? So you have like a stone and, and basically there's a, a cup that someone sort of makes, or maybe it was even like a natural indentation. And historically that, those were actually associated with elves too. And what people would do to presumably appease the elves is that they would leave offerings in those cups. That's why they're, they're called elven cairns or something like that, or elven mills. And in fact, um, it's from this book here, uh, Trollum. Yeah, so yeah. anyone wants to check that out. Um, the author, Johannes Gardbach, who is just fantastic, um, talks about how people would prime that, that cup with butter. And so that's actually historically accurate too. So, I mean, if you're gonna leave uh, an offering in one of those stones, one of those stone cups, make sure you bring a stick of butter, I guess, right? So yeah, <laughs> make yeah, sure you, yeah. and, and then what happened is that they would butter that area and then they would place the, the offering um, in the cup once mm. they sort of primed it with butter. Uh, so, I mean, going off of that too, there are all kinds of other um, instances in this book. So, I highly recommend it, you know, to your audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are all kinds of uh, practices in here dealing with elves to sort of appease them, 
like you were just saying, and to make sure one doesn't get sick, you know, for example. Um, some of them are very practical. Some of them are off the wall crazy. <laughs> so, you know, for example, there's one that says, uh, if you want to get rid of a woman, take her shoe, urinate in it while she's present, and take that shoe that you've urinated in and throw it over your right shoulder, and she will never return. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there, there's some return. more dirty ones than that in there. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, we won't speak sure. about that. <laughs> People can get the book, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. So you, and Johannes is uh, I, I have nothing but good things to say about him. He's uh, yeah, and everything in that book he he lists the century it was recorded in so people yes. know that this is not any new age stuff it's like actual yeah. uh, historical practices not not going back to pagan times but i think as old as the 1400s they have some stuff in yeah there. yeah yeah it goes back to, i think yeah like you said 1400s 1500s 1600s and he doesn't distill anything so you may find some charms in there which are not um which are pretty even but then that's just the way that it's recorded because mm. later on you'll see charms where you know, God is mentioned and mm. Mary and stuff like that. Um, but then again, too, you have to ask, what is so Christian about them taking a branch from a tree at midnight on Thursday? So it can't be touched by the sun and it can't be cut by an iron knife. It has to, it's like all these different weird ritual directions, right? That's, that, that's, that's rooted in their tradition. Mm. Just throwing Mary on that cell or throwing Christ on that cell is actually really the Christian veneer, mm. right? I mean, so you're actually dealing with a lot of different pagan elements there. And I can attest that the idea of not cutting something with an iron knife, for example, is heathen. Um, it's attested on the Egya rune stone, for example. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, very good. I remember we, I don't know if I saw it in one of your videos or if we spoke about it, was that there is something, some ritual that has to do something, leaving an offering at a waterfall or a prayer at a waterfall, something like that, that I remember. Oh, yeah, we didn't get to talk about like water spirits, um, mm. but oh, oh, yeah, okay, I remember it was the old Saxon ritual um, ah. that, yeah, you were actually forbidden to do any sort of activity at a waterfall whatsoever, which I think, yeah, it was including offerings. Okay. So even right there, it tells you you are specifically not allowed to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, we do actually have, again, historical sources in the folk tales, for example, to where people went to the waterfall to get better at playing their instrument. They would actually interact with a water spirit there and somehow they would become better in their skill. Mm. Um, you know, so that's, there's an obvious correlation there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no, no elves mentioned that particular thing, but uh, yeah, this is something I remembered. All right. Any, I'm taking like two Patreon questions here. I think we've answered um, most of them. Uh, just in this video, but a couple quick ones. Okay, we have a question here from MN. Do you see the elves as a metaphor for legendary ancestors uh, on some level or another level, uh, specifically um, speaking about pre-Christian sources, maybe not even in the sagas or eddas, but is there any other maybe linguistic evidence or, or, or runic inscriptions or things like that that you can think of? So I wouldn't look at them as metaphors because they are. They, mm -hmm. they are actually just dead ancestors. There's no reason to actually draw that metaphor. Um, I think that might come from this sort of modern contemporary understanding of what we think of when we hear the word elf, and then we want to sort of create the metaphor. Really later on with these all, crazy, these, all these crazy ideas with Christmas elves and stuff like that, that's not what they thought about back then anyway. So there's no reason to actually have to project from today onto then and sort of create the metaphor because again they just were they were dead ancestors mm, yeah, yeah yeah okay yep yeah, yep yeah. pretty easy pretty uh yeah i guess that's some more um would take some more kind of spiritual work and kind of playing around and, and interpreting these myths in a much more specific way for people but um yes for me at least i believe that most of the attestations we have of them can be explain that they are ancestral spirits of some sort mm -hmm. um and and we have different uh, cultures around the world believing in things like this too um that's especially yeah. that there's uh and you did a video on different parts to the soul which was really good i think people should check out too but in mm -hmm. a lot of cultures especially asia 
in Oceania, they believed that they had a little person. They didn't call them elves. I, f- I forget the name for them. They have different names in different countries, but it's they have a little elf like in the center of their body. And that's that's the one that's basically like controlling them in life. And in death, that uh, little person goes out and it wanders around and it gets up to no good. And I thought that was a really, re- I mean, at least in appearance and function, they, they uh, are a lot like the elves, but as far as the actual elf living inside and then exiting when they die, we don't have any records of that in the Scandinavian or Germanic sources, but I thought that was a really uh, yeah, big similarity. Yeah, no. Um, I'm trying to think of the different parts of the soul too, which I'm quite familiar with. But, yeah, it's no, no um, I can't think of any either. The, the closest the thing could be like a filgia, but then you even have to argue that the filgia is a part of the soul complex. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, right, or maybe it's just the the fact that they are that sort of high noble ancestor. Because again, if you link it to the Dees or the Deesir, and you have Freya being the the noble woman of the Vanir, there's nothing about a Dees that needs to be a part of the soul, mm. right? That's just sort of like the disposition of the the being or the figure. And um, we know, for example, that uh, in Old English, we have all kinds of names that are recorded that have the word elf in them. Mm-hmm. And these figures were actually very noble people. So uh, some examples here are uh, Alfred, which is literally elf council. And we have Alfric, which is like elf power. We have elf beost, which is elf bright. And we have elf north in which case is, I think, Elf of Valor or something like that. Um, and so the majority of these names are actually recorded, like I said, with instances of men with um, high noble rank. So going back to the soul thing again, um, I think it's more of a status and disposition that one becomes or is an elf, mm-hmm. just like the Dees, like the noble woman. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some sort of idea tied to the soul, but if we are contrasting it to like the Sabloat and Alpha Bloat and the Ds versus the the Elf, then it uh, makes more sense for like rank and disposition to me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And, and those names, right? The Alfreds and the, mm-hmm. uh, the especially the old English name, it's it tends to be like kings and noble class people, right? Yeah, you don't yeah, exactly. see regular people a lot with those names. Is that is that no, right? I mean nowadays, yes, but of yeah, course yeah. The, the belief system isn't here anymore. Yeah, so yeah. like the, the name Alfred is still somewhat common, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. an interesting thing to speak about. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else? Anything else that you'd uh, like to speak about the elves? I think we've answered all the questions that have come in and, and spoken about a lot of things. Anything else that you feel is uh, maybe important to add? So uh, first and foremost, I am an educator, of course. Uh, so to that end, what I wanted to do is go ahead and recommend some sources for your audience. Yeah, yes, um, please. Because I do know what it's like not having a clue as to what you're doing. And you go to random Google and you say books on fairies. And, you know, it's already, you know, like I said, the word fairy is already problematic too, because that's actually a, a Latin term. My point is, though, is that you don't really know what the heck you're going to get yourself into. Um, so as I had mentioned before, there's trolldom by Johannes Gardbuck, right? So I guess we can go ahead and put these in the description below. Yeah, I can put them in the description and put it up on the screen here too. And we have, this is one of my personal favorites. This is Scandinavian Folk and Belief, yeah. uh, Scandinavian Folk, Belief and Legend by yeah, Fiddler yeah. and Simsdorf. This is excellent, especially for any of your viewers who want to go beyond the elves but want to really understand that full complex system because there are tales in here about um, the hoog, like, which is like your mind, stealing your neighbor's milk or something like that or and uh there's tales in here about death and the philgia and so on and so forth so yeah i highly recommend this one um i use this to teach at berkeley Mm. so really i I got that one just recently last year sometime and it's just there's no we have books of folk tales all over um and Mm -hmm. you can read the folk tales like stories like that but that one is just so good at like taking little excerpts and organizing it by subject like that so it's It's perfect perfect. it's like it's like an encyclopedia for people who want to get into this stuff more yeah definitely it's also a nice uh nice read just to lay down and you know read a couple stories and then you pass out so uh this is also one of my personal favorites. I use this at Berkeley as well. This is by Jacqueline Simpson. This is, uh, there we go, Icelandic Folk Tales and Legends. So Jacqueline Simpson is just an all-around really good scholar. 
And uh, she actually wrote an article called uh, The Ambiguity of Elves, which inspired me to ask you, what is an elf? Because she kind of goes through that and, and talks about what an elf actually is. So um, really good scholar there. Just two more. Uh, I got one here by, actually I lied, I got a few more. I got one, one here people called- People uh, are thirsty for this information, I'm sure. Hey, look, look like this it. is the thing, right? It's like, if, you, if you're really dedicated and really truly honestly interested in pursuing these things, you're gonna want this kind of information. So yeah, hopefully yeah. some people do get something out of it. Absolutely. Um, this is the tradition of household spirits. So ancestral lore and practices. This is actually by Claude Luckatu right there. Mm. Uh, this is really cool because it, of course, it talks about the folk tradition and it talks about, you know, these, these, these house spirits that you're supposed to interact with. But they actually, like he actually goes through and gives you certain pictures, for example, of where you see this art, right? And like tales sort of tied to um, how one should integrate the belief system into the house and into the practice. And Claude Luckatu is an amazing folklorist. Uh, he's got a PhD. I mean, he's just really good, really knows the stuff. Yeah. Um, and then we'll just, you know, I'll just mention one more because it's grim. Yeah. So this is by Jack Zipe. That is called uh, the complete first edition of the Brothers Grimm. So if you're looking for a good translation of the Brothers Grimm, right there by Jack Zipe. So. Yeah, and these those books, the, the the third one you mentioned, I hadn't read, so I'll have to check that one out. But also the great thing about those books is we can, the Scandinavians can find these, or a German can find these written pretty easily, and, and lots more sources even. But in English, it's it's still very valuable because you'll get some scholar who did it in the past, you know, few decades, and they have a way of organizing it in a way that is not there in the original Scandinavian yeah. sources. So it's very valuable. You're not missing out on anything if you don't uh, speak Scandinavian on these. Yeah, totally. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So that's a good episode. And I hope uh, people have uh, gotten some spiritual uh, guidance out of this and, and found some value in it. But that's uh, thank you so much. I learned a lot right. too. And I uh, uh, hope to speak again soon. Thank you, Scott. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.